Hello, everyone. Welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for today's event, When Drugs Don't Work, Learning from Experts About Microbial Resistance, AMR. Just to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube and we are live from Four Space, located here on unceded indigenous lands in Chichage, Montreal. Four Space, we work with our university community to help mobilize knowledge. We co-create daily activities to examine research questions, projects, things happening across the university. And we're running today's event as a live streamed Zoom meeting. So we welcome comments, questions, via the chat if you're joining us there and for those of you here in, in the space just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone over to you so everyone can hear and with that it's very much my pleasure to hand it over to phd candidate and Pub concordia public scholar in the department of chemistry and biochemistry laura dominguez mercado laura welcome in thank you Thank you very much everyone for being here and for joining whether online or in person i would like to thank uh, the the team at force space for making this event possible and i would also like to thank our panelists for joining us and uh, sharing their expertise on antimicrobial resistance um, yeah thank you very much for being here it's truly an honor to have you here thank you for making the time uh, after the panel we will be taking questions from the audience so whether you're experienced in amr or you just recently learned the term like it's very good to have you here, thank you. And um, yes, we'll talk about what antimicrobial resistance is, how it happens, and why it's so important that we all know about it and we learn about it and we act upon it. So microorganisms live in very tough conditions. They are constantly adapting to new environments. They exist everywhere around us and inside of us. Bacteria, which is one type of microorganism, quickly grows and adapts, and they live in in very inhabit in hospital spaces like acidic stomachs and salty seas. They are virtually everywhere. And even though we can't see them, they are a huge part of our everyday lives. They allow us to metabolize nutrients and maintain oral and gut health. And we keep discovering ways in which the microorganisms inside, of, inside us interact with our bodies. Um, so biotechnological advances have also made it so that this already incredibly uh, useful organisms are even more so. So beer, cheese, yogurt, and even the production of some uh, medicines are possible thanks to microorganisms. Unfortunately, even though only a small percentage of bacterial species are pathogenic, meaning that they can cause disease, bacterial infections are responsible for more than 7.7 .7 million deaths worldwide every year. Antimicrobial resistance refers to the resistance of any type of microorganism, not just bacteria, but also fungi, viruses, and parasites. Antibiotic resistance, on the other hand, is a subset of antimicrobial resistance. It refers specifically to the resistance of bacteria to antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance gets a lot of attention because bacterial infections are very common and antibiotics are widely used. So we will focus mostly on bacteria today. The discovery of antibiotics in 1928 significantly advanced medicine by treating infections that were previously deadly. Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, warned that bacteria could develop resistance to these drugs. Today, misuse and overuse of antibiotics have accelerated resistance, making it significant, a significant global health concern. Addressing AMR uh, requires a comprehensive One Health approach, um, um, which is understanding that um, animal, human, and environmental health, they are all interconnected. And if we want to tackle this uh, global health problems, we really need to understand the interconnectedness of them all. So we will dive into the present and future of AMR. Uh, what is that we can do about it uh, to slow it down and to avoid its spread and prevalence? So with this, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, we have Monte Mora Ochomogo. Uh, Monte Mora Ochomogo is a second year PhD student at Queen's University in Kingston, working in Dr. Lohan's lab. Before arriving in Canada, she earned her degree in biotechnology engineering from Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. Before starting her PhD, she completed a mini master's program also at Queen's University. Monza's research project focuses on studying antibiotic resistance and antibiotic sheltering, particularly in the context of co-bacterial infections. Her interest and passion for bacteria began at a young age when uh, she was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. This personal experience drove her to pursue research in the field and learning about the disease, the impact of bacterial infections and the limitations of existing treatments. Thank you very much for being here all the way from Kingston. 
Um, we also have uh, Dr. Jennifer Ronholm. Uh, she obtained her bachelor's in microbiology from the University of Waterloo in 2007 and her doctoral degree in microbiology and immunology from the University of Ottawa in 2013. She completed postdoctoral training at McGill University um, uh, at McGill University and at Health Canada. She holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Agricultural Microbiology and her interests are primarily in understanding the role of the microbiome in determining susceptibility of agricultural animals to infections. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We also have with us uh, Dr. Makeda Semrit. Dr. Makeda Semrit is an Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at McGill University. She specializes in infectious diseases and medical microbiology she leads the antimicrobial stewardship program of the McGill University Health Center and is the director of the McGill training program in infectious diseases and medical microbiology. Her current research focus is on inappropriate antibiotic use in healthcare settings, including testing different interventions for low resource settings in Ethiopia. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Um, and lastly, we have uh, Dr. Brandon Finley, who completed his bachelor's at Simon Fraser University followed by a PhD at the University of Manitoba with Dr. Franz Weiser and an Alberta Innovates Health Solutions Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of Alberta with Dr. John Bederas. He started his independent career at Concordia University in 2015 and is currently an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry with a cross appointment to the Department of Biology. His work focuses on the intersection of bacteria and complex small molecules, including both the discovery and development of novel antibiotics and the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Billy. Um, and so we will begin uh, with some questions for our panelists to just get a general understanding of what antimicrobial resistance is and how it happens. So Monse, if you could start us off with some basic definitions. Um, could you tell us just what are antibiotics? Hello. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, being here and online. And uh, well, for me, or when like what I've studied and what I've like uh, learned, antibiotics are like uh, substances that can either kill bacteria or inhibit the growth of bacteria. And uh, are uh, very, very important for not only like infections, but also like uh, treatment in uh, surgeries and uh, multiple other diseases. So yeah, this are, these are very important molecules and um, it's, yeah, well, they're, they're very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monse. Um, so Dr. Finley, uh, most of the antibiotics that we use today um, uh, hit the same key uh, few targets. Could you tell us uh, what these are? Like, how do antibiotics actually kill bacteria? Okay, of course. And so the cell kind of at its core is a very complex machine and antibiotics are really good at finding the weak points in it. The little gears that once blocked will cause the entire thing to grind to a halt. So this could be, for example, in the ribosome a huge superstructure that's involved in making all of the proteins in the cell. If a compound inhibits the ribosome or corrupts its function so that it starts making nonsense, that pretty quickly leads to the cell either grinding to a halt or even dying due to all of the malformed proteins. You could also target the cell itself. You can pop the cell like a bubble, causing the cell's insides to become its outsides and everything to collapse pretty shortly or you could target DNA synthesis, you could target the biosynthesis of a lot of the components that the cell needs in order to function. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so now that we know what antibiotics are and, uh, and how they kill, uh, Monsu, would you mind telling us like through what mechanisms um, does this happen? Like how do, um, like yeah, through what mechanisms can bacteria become resistant to an antibiotic? Sure, so, um... Bacteria are very good at adapting and uh, developing mechan resistance mechanisms. And um, there are a bunch of mechanisms known. Uh, one that I, uh, me and, well, our lab studies, um, particularly is the production of enzymes that degrade antibiotics. Uh, it can be beta-lactamases or other types of enzymes. Um, so with, through this type of uh, resistance mechanisms, 
the uh, bacteria secretes certain enzymes that um, make the antibiotics not use not useful anymore. Um, there's other types of resistance like uh, efflux pumps where the bacteria has these kind of like um, <clears throat> pumps um, that secrete the antibiotics. So uh, if the target is um, inside the cell, uh, then if the antibiotic gets out, of course, it cannot get to its target. <coughs> um, there are other mechanisms as um, permeability. Um, bacteria can uh, decrease the expression of, of porins, which are um, canals, little canals through which antibiotics get in. So if these porins are not being expressed, the antibiotics cannot get in. Um, so yeah, that's uh, our one of like most important uh, resistance mechanisms, and um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so you mentioned like a lot of uh, mutations and ways in which bacteria uh, can um, ad resist these antibiotics. Dr. Finley, could you tell us how these uh, mutations happen? Like the bacteria just decide what they want to do. They see antibiotics and they're like, I. Did they consciously decide to mutate? How does this process happen? So every time a cell divides, there's a chance that it will make an error when it's replicating its DNA, when it's replicating kind of the blueprint for the cell itself. It can't pick when those errors arise. It can't really pick where those errors arise. It's a completely random process. So if you have kind of a handful of changes in a genome that's 4 million letters 4 million bases long, the odds of any given cell division giving you resistance to any compound is pretty small. The reason antibiotic resistance is such a big problem is, on the one hand, because any infection involves billions and billions of cells. So whether, while the odds of any individual cell becoming resistant are very small, so are the cells, and there are an awful lot of them. So it becomes very likely in an infection that you could get that one key mutation or that small handful of mutations that give resistance to a drug that's being used. Mm -hmm. The other issue is molecule or enzymes that the cell can use to get rid of antibiotics, to degrade them, to render itself more immune, can be passed between organisms through little circles of DNA, plasmids as well as a number of different mobile genetic elements. And when that happens, you can have one cell have one of these things and become resistant, but then share it with all of its friends. And so resistance can go not just from one cell to all of its little progenitors, all of its little daughter cells. It can spread throughout a lot of the different bacteria that would be in a hospital setting, for example, and cause a much bigger issue. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, Dr. Makita, could you tell us how would you explain antimicrobial resistance to your patients? So, um, so generally, first, oftentimes you have to kind of explain what an infection is, and you've mentioned the word microbes, uh, and uh, not all microbes are pathogenic, but I usually try to explain specifically for that patient what their infection means and how it came about. <laughs> Um, and then I would say, you know, normally, explain that normally for every specific type of syndrome, we have a bunch of causative, typical causative organisms uh, for which there's a treatment, a specific antibiotic that's been designed for those particular bacteria. And I would explain that in their case, uh, their treatment is resistant to the first line or to the standard uh, treatment uh, that, that we use for, for them. And that doesn't mean that they are resistant to an antibiotic, it means their infection is resistant to the treatment. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I think, yeah, when we hear of this resistance, that's kind of like the first, uh, the first place our minds go, like, is it me that I'm being resistant? Um, and yeah, like, how do you currently see AMR manifesting in clinical settings? So as, as Dr. Finley uh, mentioned, I think that the biggest challenge is really in the hospital. It doesn't mean that there is no resistance in the community. There is resistance in the community settings as well. I, I don't particularly work in the community setting, but there are certain instances, for example, urinary tract infections in young women. Um, they, the treatments that we used to use 10, 20 years ago no longer work. So we have gone, 
we are forced to change and rotate the antibiotics at our first line for even very healthy young women with urinary tract infections or cases of bronchitis, for example. You know, so that there are those settings, but in the hospital setting, all of that is accelerated. So the, the hospital setting is really an environment where there's a, a big confluence of events. So you have, on the one hand, patients that are particularly vulnerable. So they not only have, they could be very old, but they also could have underlying uh, medical conditions that put them at high risk of not being able to combat the infection with their normal immune system. Um, they're also lying down. And lying down means that a lot of bad things happen when you're lying down. Um, their, their normal microbial flora, right? I'm sure people have heard of microbiomes. So that all gets disrupted when you're in a different environment. When you're lying down in a bed for days on end or weeks on end, that whole, gets, that whole thing gets disrupted. So that also is a predisposing factor. Additionally, people are in hospital and we do things to them. We put in lines, we put in catheters, we may be doing procedures like surgery. So we're, we're harming their natural defenses. We're, we're, uh, we're essentially disrupting their barriers to acquiring infections. And the final thing is that they're also in close proximity to a large number of other patients. So this goes to the transmission of potentially drug resistant organisms from patient to patient from the environment to them, or from a healthcare worker who may not have washed their hands properly to them. So all of those, that confluence of events means that, A, they're more likely to develop an infection in hospital. So that's the famous hospital acquired or hospital associated infection. And that infection is more likely to be, or can, poses a risk of being drug resistant yes. or antibiotic resistant. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Um, Dr. Ronholm. Would you mind telling us how do human activities contribute to the development of antimicrobial resistance? Yeah, um, well, humans do a lot of things with antibiotics, including using them in hospitals. Um, but we also use them for a number of instances in terms of food production mm -hmm. and agricultural uses. Um, so when we use them to grow uh, animals in a farm production system, we give large doses uh, to farm animals or subclinical doses to farm animals. Um, and this use or overuse or misuse allows the bacteria a chance to catch up and allows the bacteria a chance to learn how to evade it in a system. Um, so how do humans contribute through our activities using antibiotics where we use them? Yeah, thank you very much. So you mentioned the, um, like using uh, antibiotics for animals and you're like, almost 80% of the antibiotics that we use are not given to humans, but actually are given to, um, to livestock. Uh, so this accounts for over 13 million kilograms. Uh, could you tell us in what situations or why are antibiotics given to animals? Yeah, there's a lot of variation there. Um, so it will depend on which country you're in and what livestock species you're talking about um, and what farm you're on even. Uh, but generally, if we're talking about a Canadian context, we give animals antibiotics if they're sick. And no one really contests that. We're supposed to give antibiotics to animals if they're sick. But sometimes we use it to prevent infections. Um, and sometimes we also use it in terms of growth promotion to make the animals grow faster. Uh, so we use it in those three ways. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you all very much for all those comprehensive explanations. Uh, now we'd like to follow along with some questions um, so that we learn a bit more about the very fascinating work that you all carry out. Um, so maybe we can start with Dr. Finley, he's uh, right here. So Dr. Finley, could you describe your research and what you have been, uh, like what have been some interesting findings uh, you have served in relation to antimicrobial resistance evolution? Of course. So one of the things that my lab is trying to do is to take bacteria that are susceptible to antibiotics and in a lab setting, render them immune to the antibiotics. This allows us to study how they become resistant and it allows us to study a little bit what's the requirement for resistance and what makes it easy to develop resistance against one drug and hard to develop resistance against another. And we've found a lot of cool things along the way. One of the things that we found pretty early on was 
when we started, there was this assumption that if you want to know if a drug that could be a potential antibiotic was going to have resistance emerge later on in clinical use, you could check how often a mutation that conveyed resistance to it arose. And so this was called the frequency of resistance conferring mutations. And the thought was, if you were below a certain number, the resistance would come too quick and you'd run into problems. If you were above that number, resistance would come slowly and you could potentially use this in a clinical setting. And what we found when we started evolving resistance was it didn't really matter what that number was. We were getting resistance the same. And we did have some drugs that had very low frequencies that were evolving resistance quite quickly and some drugs that had very high frequencies that were evolving it relatively slow. And instead, what seemed to matter in the evolution settings we were working with was just the impact of those mutations. So if there was a mutation that had a huge effect that changed the level of resistance by a wide margin, resistance evolved really quick because that allowed the newly resistant bacteria to separate themselves from the rest really efficiently. If the impact of the mutation was small, if it was like a five or a 20% change in susceptibility, that didn't have much of an impact and the cells couldn't really distinguish themselves. They weren't able to emerge and develop higher level resistance. And so that really got us looking at kind of what the impact of the mutation was, not necessarily did it make the cell strong or more resistant, but what effect did it have in a broader context? And how did that help it compete against other cells that were in the nearby area? Yeah, thank you very much. That's very interesting. And yeah, it's important to learn how this evolution is happening so that we can better predict it and maybe adjust our strategies. So because we see it happening in the clinic all the time. So it's important that we have this uh, research. Thank you very much, Dr. Finley. Um, Dr. Uh, Samrit, so you study inappropriate antibiotic use and interventions in low research settings. Uh, could you tell us about your research and the motives behind this international collaboration uh, in Ethiopia? So uh, I study it both in high income, so in the Canadian setting and in, uh, and in the Ethiopian setting. The motivation for the Ethiopian setting um, preceded actually my interest in AMR. Um, it was, um, I, I wasn't, I've been in, so I'm not, I'm originally from Ethiopia, I speak the language, etc. And some 14, 15 years ago, I was invited by some of the academic uh, uh, physicians of the university there to help start an infectious disease training program for Ethiopia. Uh, so in the course of, so that became kind of a, a big project. And in the course of going back and forth to teach these residents, uh, the, infect, the, the discipline of infectious diseases and medical microbiology, you know, there was one part was the lectures. That's kind of easy. You have students that are eager, but medicine is an apprenticeship. So we also had to go around the hospital and see patients and learn at the bedside. That's a, actually more than 50% of our training is really at the bedside. And when we were doing that, it just struck me uh, over the years how um, a very large number of patients had ongoing infections and that we were completely operating in the blind because their diagnostic modalities were insufficient for the complexity of the patients. And there was also a lot of you know, deaths and you know, very high mortality rates in very young patients who clearly had what I could see that was you know, sepsis or a very obvious bacterial infection and you would be kind of shooting in the dark. So it became, and at the same time, so because we were shooting in the dark, the, the antimicrobial use was excessive. 80% to 90% of patients in the hospital were on antibiotics at any one time, uh, compared to here, where, which is, you know, I work at the, the fancy Glen Hospital, where it's a quaternary care hospital. People are referred from, you know, a, a, around the country for a transplant and for a very advanced procedure. And even for that very specific patient population with very advanced procedures, we only use antibiotics in 30% of the, 
of the patient population maximum. So the you know there was such a big discrepancy that I that I got interested in you know how can we optimize antimicrobial use, and of course that led to some projects on hospital acquired infections and actually quantifying the burden, and then very quickly realized that the burden was much much higher. The burden of AMR was much much higher in that setting than it will ever be here. Mm -hmm. It's already at the first time we looked at it, it was already sky high. So, so that started uh, uh, the whole my whole interest and motivation in doing that. Yeah, thank you very much. It's very interesting, and I, I'm a firm believer that this uh, disparity is just uh, it's in everyone's best interest to address. As it's a, just so important. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Ronholm, uh, could you tell us about your research and what you've learned about the interactions? between pathogenic bacteria and the microbiome? Sure. Um, so when I started my research program, my idea was kind of, you know, it, we can't really just stop using antibiotics in agriculture because we still have to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and we need productivity to stay high because, you know, Canadian food prices have been rising for a while. If we stopped using antibiotics in food production, food prices would rise rapidly because we'd be producing so much less food. So I was thinking, how can we replace that technology? How can we replace antibiotics and still have enough food and still keep the infections out of the animals? Because you want the animals to be happy and healthy and not full of infections as well. So I was thinking maybe we could take their microbiome and optimize it so that it's like a first line of protection against um, infections. And at the heart of it, that's kind of what antibiotics do for growth promotion, like antibiotics modify the microbiome of the cows or the chickens in such a way that most of the nutrient goes to the animal instead of most of the nutrient going to the microbiome. So we're trying to look at how bacterial pathogens interact with good <laughs> microorganisms that live in the animal and particularly find ones that really don't like the pathogen. And you know, as we're getting further into this and looking at interactions and network analysis of you know, what lives there already, we are finding that there are a lot of organisms that naturally occur in healthy animals that specifically don't like Staphylococcus aureus and E. coli. And we're trying to figure out ways we can optimize that um, and put it into more animals, that more animals have this first line of defense against infections. That is very interesting. Thank you. It's, uh... Very important to have uh, alternatives because we can't really just stop it altogether. Thank you very much. Uh, and Monse, could you describe uh, your PhD research and what you're trying to accomplish? Um, sure. So, like I said before, our our lab focuses on beta lactams, which are the most used kind of antibiotics worldwide. And um, my research specifically focuses on uh, co-infections. So, like bacterial co-infections. So normally, well, never, you only have just one microbe like in an infection. There's always existing a lot of uh, other microbes, uh, either, as you said, viruses, fungi, bacteria. So what I'm interested in is um, in diseases such as cystic fibrosis, when it is very common that um, patients get colonized with more than one pathogenic bacteria in their lungs. And um, I'm interested in like that um, relation between each of the bacteria because, for example, both can have a different um, profile of, profiles of resistance. And then this can lead to one of the bacteria kind of protecting or sheltering the other one when you're treating it with antibiotics. So this, of course, makes uh, treatments uh, fail a lot of times. And it makes a lot more complicated the entire, um, uh, not diagnostic, but like a treatment of certain uh, of those infections. So my research focuses on um, that. Uh, how is like the interplay of this uh, pathogenic bacteria when one is resistant to certain antibiotic and the other one is not? And how this <clears throat> kind of sheltering of occurs? And uh, also I'm very interested in like what prompts this, sh this sheltering. Um, we've seen <clears throat> that bacteria can secrete certain metabolites that can enhance uh, this sheltering and um, also can like have, well, like just release certain um, also like vesicles that can 
help do the sheltering. So this is like where I'm like right now. And um, what, uh, like, like you said, what I would like to accomplish um, would be just to have like a really uh, deep understanding about this and uh, what can, how can we translate this to the actual like clinic, right? If we know that this certain metabolite is making um, the sheltering um, a bigger problem, how can we address it? Like what can we do uh, to combat the um, production of that certain metabolite or how can we just like, kind of maybe get rid of that um, so we can maybe uh, stop or decrease the level of sheltering that happens in co-bacterial co infections. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you for sharing this. It's a very fascinating work that you do. It's very critical and it really shows how multifactorial the AMR problem is. It's not just human health or animal health. Uh, it's also policy making and economics and politics. So thank you very much for sharing that. And I would like to leverage the very diverse expertise that we have in the room today to discuss the present uh, of AMR. So what's the current situation, the current state? Um, so uh, yeah, the first question is for Dr. Finley. Um, and yeah, so most of the antibiotics that we use today are naturally produced by microorganisms. And most of them were discovered between the 40s and the 70s in this golden age of antibiotics. Uh, but unfortunately, fewer and fewer antibiotics and antibiotics classes have been discovered since then. Uh, could you tell us like, what challenges are being faced in the discovery of new antibiotics? So I think there's a number of challenges that we're facing. Um, on the science end of things, one of the big issues is the majority of our antibiotics come from microbes. They come from bacteria, they come from fungi. And so when we go out to find new ones, we keep finding the old ones. And it was really great when Alexander Fleming found a bacteria that was producing penicillin, but people don't really celebrate the seventh person to find that bacteria or that fungi again. And so we have this huge issue of dereplication where people will spend a month, six months, a few years to isolate and characterize all these new compounds only to find out that they aren't new compounds, they're old compounds. And so that means that the productivity just in the discovery process goes down every time we find a new thing. The other end of it is the financial end. When you prescribe for an antibiotic, you run a treatment course of a few weeks, a few months at most, and then you're done. And if you have a really, really good new antibiotic, you don't prescribe it at all. You preserve it for those few cases where literally nothing else will do. And that's the one thing that you can use against this given infection. And so from a financial end, antibiotics are about the worst thing to do drug discovery on, because the more successful you are, the less money you make. Whereas if you discover a new chemotherapeutic, for example, that's just a bit better than all of the others, that would be given to everyone that it's effective against, everyone with a cancer that it could treat. And so the financials of it really don't make a lot of sense, which has left antibiotic discovery largely to academic labs like my own. And I mean, we're really good, but we can't equal a pharmaceutical company with thousands upon thousands of workers. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. And yeah, it also highlights the importance of like changes in policy that allow this incentives for, for new antibiotic discovery. And thank you very much. Um, yeah, the follow up on that as well. So like after all this hurdle, like you find a new antibiotic, you manage to get into the market and then we see resistance happening very shortly after. Um, could you just tell us like, are all antibiotics just as susceptible to become, to, for bacteria to become resistant to them? Uh, there's definitely a gradient of susceptibility mm -hmm. to evolution. There have been drugs that have actually failed in clinical trials back in the phase two study when we're looking at efficacy mm -hmm. because resistance evolved in the patient mm -hmm. during treatment. And so in those cases, it evolved so quickly that the physicians couldn't even complete the course of treatment before it was effectively rendered obsolete. 
On the other end of things, we have drugs like vancomycin, which was first discovered in the late 60s, early 70s in Borneo. Mm -hmm. And this was given its name for its ability to vanquish drug resistant bacteria. And it is really good at its job. And we didn't see resistance for 13 years or so until or after its initial introduction. And then we did. And now vancomycin resistance infections are a major problem. So there's definitely a gradient. Some compounds it's much easier for bacteria to evolve resistance to, some it's much harder. The only real constant we've seen is that whatever the compound, given enough time, evolution will find an answer to it. Thank you very much. It's, yeah, it's a bit scary, but I guess we, can, um, we can't stop evolution. We can just try to slow it down as much as we can. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Makeda, can you tell us uh, what are the most uh, common pathogens associated with hospital-acquired infections and what diseases do they cause? So the, uh, the most common, there's, there's quite a few, but usually um, the gram negatives, so I don't know how familiar the audience is, but within the gram negatives, you know, the, the common ones are E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter species, Pseudomonas, you know, and in some countries, Acinetobacter. So those are common causes of hospital acquired infections, but so is Staph aureus, um, Enterococcus species. So it's a, it's a group of pathogens, and the syndromes that are the most common, um, the, the, the most common types of hospital associated infections would be, for example, surgical site infections. So a patient has had surgery, and a few days later or a few months later, they develop an infection at the incision site or inside the body cavity. For example, if they had a hardware put in um, an artificial hip that the, the prosthesis gets infected. It can also be as simple as a hospital acquired pneumonia. So that's also extremely common or a ventilator associated pneumonia in the ICU. And finally, uh, urinary tract infections that are associated with catheter use. Um, line infections that are associated with central lines, so patients that are in hospital for a long time for which IV access becomes problematic, they get lines into the big veins, mm -hmm. uh, and so those uh, catheters get infected. So the organisms that, I've, that I listed earlier are the ones that are more likely to cause the kinds of infections that I described. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there is a particular group of bacteria that are hanging around the hospital, it's that these syndromes occur and those are the bacteria that are associated with these syndromes. Thank you very much. And when a patient comes uh, with an infection, could you guide us through the process? Like when they're admitted, how do you um, evaluate, identify, and, and treat the patient? So uh, very simply, very simple and kind of standard approach to almost anything in medicine, which is you start by getting a history. So you ask the patient what the, their symptoms are and when they started and how they've evolved and where do they migrate, you know. And you also need the background of any other medical problems that the patient has and medications that they take. Um, you then perform, I would then perform a physical, a thorough physical examination to try to see if I can detect any findings, if any part of their, if any of their organs seem enlarged, if I hear murmurs, sounds of a pneumonia when I auscultate their, their lungs, etc. And review whatever investigation is already available from recent blood tests or imaging studies. And then you try to always formulate. So before um, sending off all sorts of blood tests, you have to, the best way to, it, you really have to try to formulate um, a probable diagnosis in your mind. And that's a very important step because that informs what tests you're going to order. Mm -hmm. And so there is an approach to the investigations. It's really based on your clinical assessment of the most probable diagnosis and maybe the second possibility, third possibility. And then, and then you also, depending on the urgency, you either start an immediate treatment plan. So if the patient looks very sick and not, looks like they're kind of critical, you're not going to get your answers, or your, your confirmation until maybe 48 hours later, maybe later, maybe even longer. So you have to have a plan, a management plan that's adapted to the particular context. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and what uh, challenges do African hospitals face um, in controlling hospital-acquired infections compared to Canadian hospitals? 
So that's a very big question and there's a lot of challenges and, and I think, and, and again, when we say low and middle income countries, we were just talking about this earlier, you know, that's a huge bucket and we've put in every country from a small country in sub-Saharan Africa to China, right? So it's not, they're not all the same, mm -hmm. but the settings that I'm most familiar, I would say there's often infrastructure issues, then there is the operationalizing healthcare delivery issues, there is people issues, and then there is a, a volume of patients issue or type of patient issue. So from the infrastructure perspective, a lot of the hospitals in some country, and I will, I'm not gonna say in every country, because again, you know, you have some Asian countries that have beautiful and evolved and modern clean hospitals, but in other places, the infrastructure, the, the, the actual building, uh, may not have all of the plumbing and the electricity, but, and this is very important for infection control, right? So if you, you there are the hospital where I work in Ethiopia part-time, that's a tertiary ref reference level hospital where the medical school is housed there. And any patient with cancer from around the country gets transferred there to receive their chemotherapy. But in one room, there could be up to 16 patients. So it's a 16 bedded room and there would be one bathroom and maybe two sinks for an entire floor. And this is a hospital that can house 800 patients. So these are, you know, that's the way it was built because that was, uh, so there are massive issues just from that simple, um, simple infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And you can't kind of dictate, you know, kind of, you can't go say, build a hospital with only private rooms, right? Mm -hmm. And with bathrooms in every, you know, there's a lot of those mm -hmm. kinds of issues that are larger than healthcare. Um, and then there's a lot of issues with delivery of healthcare. I mean, a lot of the health systems in developing countries or LMICs, um, you know, some 40 years ago or maybe 50 years ago, there was this big UN declaration that the focus for poor countries should be primary care, basic primary care. And the focus was really on training community healthcare workers. You know, these countries don't really need very advanced stuff because their mm -hmm. problems are malnutrition, hunger, and childhood, uh, you know, so vaccination. And so, so you're in a way still trying to address the, the gaps. So it's kind of 40 years or 50 years of not developing mm -hmm. sophisticated healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there was also epidemics, right? HIV and there's malaria and there's TB. And every time there's one of those things happen, everybody's focus goes to that one disease and then all the investment goes to that one disease. And then you're still not taking care of the basic or basic and advanced care. So I think there's a lot of challenges and probably the only way I can answer is to say, consider everything, don't oversimplify. And you know, we, we have to stop thinking that there's going to be a, a simple solution there isn't, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's sort of doing a lot of things for a long time. Yes, yes thank you. I'm depressing, aren't I? <laughs> no, it's a, no, it's really important because, uh, yeah, there's still so much work that needs to be done and it's, uh, yeah, it's important to keep it in mind. Thank you. Um, and lastly, uh, no, another question for Dr. Samrit. Uh, can you tell us what is antimicrobial stewardship and how do you measure the success of an antimicrobial stewardship uh, program? Yeah, so stewardship, antimicrobial stewardship is really around stewarding uh, the, um, the, the very precious resources that are antimicrobials. So in a hospital, we, we are really talking about developing a program which consists of a very systematic approach to, to uh, optimizing the use of antibiotics in a hospital. So that means avoiding or limiting the inappropriate use and limiting the excessive use uh, of, of antibiotics with a view to obviously improving um, the quality of care and patient outcomes, and also at a societal level or at a hospital level to reducing the emergence of, uh, of antimicrobial resistance. So it consists of, of a group of people. So it's, um, it's usually infectious disease specialists and pharmacists are the expert part of the, uh, of the program. There's like a structure, a governance structure and a way we interact with everybody. It's all kind of written out and mapped out. And we have a bunch of activities that we do. And those activities are really um, interventions. And it, there are many different types of interventions. So we review our strategies yearly 
uh, to try to see what will make sense in our setting, where are our areas where we've seen the most inappropriate use and how can we address it? So, you know, things like auditing antibiotic use and providing immediate feedback, doing educational activities, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. And then, and so to get to your question around how do we measure the, the success, I mean, we look at our processes and see whether we're um, meeting our performance indicators for all the processes we've outlined. And then we look at the outcomes, which are, did we reduce inappropriate use of antibiotics? Did we reduce overall use? You know, and that's not an end in itself, but did we re reduce inappropriate use of antimicrobials? What is our resistance profile looking like now compared to two years ago, five years ago? So we do trends over time. And we're really trying to see whether we're changing outcomes in patients. Because technically, if you reduce inappropriate use, that means you're also reducing unintended consequences of antibiotics. And antibiotics, although they're by and large a very safe category of, of drugs, they do also come with adverse events. Mm -hmm. and, and we've never really quantified those adverse events, but I think we're now trying to see what is the risk of giving somebody inappropriate antibiotics? Is it in the range of you know two percent for two uh, percent two days? You know, so we, we don't actually have a very good handle of that, and that's one of the things that we're really trying to address. Yes, thank you very much. Then yeah, that's uh, really interesting because also the, uh, the, like the public opinion, antibiotics aren't necessarily looked as something that could be harmful for us. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it's important. There's a lot of adverse effects sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dr. Ronholm, um, like given the increasing trends in antimicrobial resistance that we observe, it's important to control uh, its use in agriculture and in animals. Uh, but like you said before, it's really not as easy as just stopping altogether its use. Like, what could be the possible impl implications if we just stopped using antibiotics altogether? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, and it's something to really think about. And I think maybe the first implication is that if we just stopped using them, what do you do when you have a sick animal? Mm -hmm. um, already, a lot of the time, uh, our choice is to euthanize the animal, like in current day, when we have uh, antibiotics. Um, for example, with dairy cows, on most farms, if they get a Staph aureus infection three times, we euthanize them. Um, so if we weren't allowed to use antibiotics at all, that rate would go up. And we see on a lot of organic farms that choose not to use antibiotics, uh, the increase in prevalence of a lot of infections. Um, so for example, chickens uh, raised without antibiotics, they tend to have burns on their feet because they have chronic diarrhea. And they tend to have airway problems because of the fumes of their chronic diarrhea. Um, so one of the implications are sicker animals. Uh, I think the other implication is, you know, we can farm with antibi without antibiotics, um, but if we choose to farm without antibiotics, we're going to need better farms than we currently have. They're going to have to be biosecure. So, like, you know, to, when you think about that, like, yeah, it's something to work towards. But if we were to rebuild every dairy barn in Canada to make it biosecure, you're talking about a major investment in um, agricultural uh, infrastructure, which would be huge for economics, and the price of food would go up as a result. Um, and you know, the farmers would need better training. They would need to be able to do all the biosecure things as well. So. And we need more food, like animals that aren't given antibiotics are less efficient in converting feed to meat or feed to milk or feed to eggs or whatever it be. Um, so, you know, you can think that that's maybe, you know, an easy thing to do, just give them all more food, but that's more field space, you know, and our, our condos are encroaching on our field space right now and how much, you know, corn do we want to grow each year. And also these, these fields require carbon emissions to harvest the corn. So there's more of those if we don't use antibiotics and more water is required for all these crops. So there's like this trickle down effect in addition to cost, but in land space and water and everything to make our food. So we have to consider all those as well. Um, so 
and you know, we also have to think about zoonotic infections. So zoonotic infections are infections that can go from a sick animal to a sick human. So if the animals that we're eating are sicker, and if the animals that the farmers are interacting with are sicker, there's a higher chance that one of these infections will transfer over to the human population eventually, or maybe frequently. So it, it's a whole messy world when we get into agriculture. I'm depressing too. <laughs> yeah. I, I was kind of expecting it to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and yes, yeah, so you mentioned in your research, uh, you work with microbial communities. Um, and how they could potentially reduce the susceptibility to infections. Uh, could you explain the scientific rationale behind using microbes to combat other microbes uh, and how this could revolutionize our current understanding and treatment of infections? Yeah, I, I mean, it'd be cool if it revolutionized things <laughs> we're always from there. Um, I think one of the most basic examples is probably Clostridium difficile. Um, so we've probably all heard of this infection if you're on antibiotics for a long time and it kind of depletes your gastric microbiome, you're more susceptible to being colonized by Clostridium difficile, which in a regular scenario isn't a good competitor. It couldn't colonize you. Um, so that's a really general example of how a good microbiome can prevent you from infection. Uh, but there's also some really specific examples. Um, so one of the ones I like to use is there's this foodborne pathogen called Listeria. Um, caused a big outbreak in Canada in 2008. Uh, it's usually with cold cut meat and stuff. Um, but it actually produces uh, an enzyme called Listeria lysin that when it gets into your gastrointestinal tract, it puts that out there and it starts killing specific members of your microbiome, uh, alloprevitella and prevotellobacteria. And in doing so, those particular bacteria produce acids that shut down the virulence gene production in Listeria. So there's this really specific interaction between these ones. And like, if we could up the concentration of these really specific microbes that specifically antagonize Listeria, could we prevent infections that way? And when we look at it in dairy cows and when we look at it in chickens, we're actually seeing similar interactions. So we're learning that there's a couple lactic acid bacteria that if they're present in a cow's udder, lots of the gram negatives don't like to colonize because of the lactic acid being there. So the, you know, if we can figure out more interactions like this on a really specific level, um, these microbiomes might be a really effective way. That's really, really fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, and Monse, um, so people with uh, cystic fibrosis are prone to bacterial lung infections. Um, how has antibiotic resistance impacted your treatment options? Um, well, I am very fortunate that I, it's not that I've not been impacted, but I am like in the lower side of, of impact, but um, I know uh, I've heard stories of um, people being colonized with um, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, Staph, and then also MRSA, which is the variant of Staph. So like if you have all these uh, pathogenic bacteria in your lungs, you <clears throat> can really run out of options on what to treat, right? Or like you, as you were saying, some of you were saying you go higher and higher in the line of treatment. And then uh, there is also like a lot more implications when you go uh, to the last line of antibiotics, right? So uh, it's kind of scary um, to be, well, to let me be living with uh, a colonizer because you don't know when um, all of a sudden it's going to be resistant to a new antibiotic, right? So I've been um, getting treated with a certain antibiotic for a lot of years now, and thankfully it hasn't uh, developed resistance, but it's something that it's always in the back of my mind, like, oh, what if um, this time uh, this certain antibiotic, it won't work, right? So it's always that, um, for me, that I know how antibiotics and resistance work. Um, it's always uh, like a worry for me that, oh, what if now this one that was kind of like an easy one for me, it's not going to work. So um, yeah, it, there's that. And then um, there's also, like I said, a lot of patients that are uh, don't have that many options. And um, it's, I would say, like, it's a scary for the patients and also for uh, the medical team, like, what, what are we going to do now? 
Thank you very much. And uh, is there anything uh, or any measures you take to avoid being further colonized by uh, different bacteria or other pathogens? Um, well, for cystic fibrosis people, it's um, very like the bacteria that we can get colonized are uh, in the environment, uh, of course, more in the hospitals, like you were saying, a hospital setting. So um, I try to be very careful wearing masks even before uh, COVID, all that. COVID was the thing, like um, I was uh, used to that. And then also um, there is uh, a lot of debate has arisen re recently about like people with CF like hanging together. So before it was very, uh, well, I was told that it was like very strict, um, do not hang out with people with CF because uh, they have certain certain uh, bacteria, even if it's the same um, Staphylococcus or whatever, the strain and the genome is going to be different, right? So like there's a lot of risk in there. And um, well, I, I believe that there's, uh, like I said, some doctors recently that are like, well, just only for certain bacteria, right? But um, so yeah, that's something I, I try to like not um, have a lot of contact with people with CF, unfortunately, or like contact in line. And and a lot of the CF population knows, knows this. Um, also, well, a lot of people around me, of course, are aware about my, um, my situation. So when they are sick with any cold, they tell me and we try to stay away as much as possible because for me if i get a cold just like even a normal cold that wouldn't impact you or anyone here um as much for me it can get very bad and i can end up in the hospital because it complicates a lot more um, my uh, bacterial situation even if it's like a viral cold so yeah try to like stay away from people that are sick um and yeah of course following treatments and all that but Thank you very much. Thank you very much for showing, sharing your story and for sharing um, all your insights. Um, so now, hopefully, it's something a bit less gloomy. So, um, well, yeah, the, the World Health Organization did uh, uh, declare AMR as one of their top 10 uh, public uh, health problems facing humanity for the next decade. So let's talk about what the future of AMR looks like. Um, so Dr. Ron Hu, um, what are the most alarming trends um, that you see today in AMR in terms of animal husbandry and agriculture? Yeah, I mean, it's just all alarming. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you know, I was trying to come up with an answer for this question, and I, I think one of the things that I found alarming is an experiment we do in my undergrad class where I have a, a class of like 50 or 60 undergrads every fall. And I tell them to go home and pick an item in their refrigerator. And as their final experiment in the class, they take that item from the refrigerator and they try to isolate a multi-drug resistant bacteria from it. And like not a pathogen, uh, just like any bacteria that's multi-drug. And over the last four years, 100% of food items have yielded multi-drug resistant bacteria. And I wasn't expecting that when we started this experiment. I was expecting like, you know, some, we get excited when someone found one, but we've never found one that didn't. And I, I think that's alarming. And I, to a certain extent, I don't really know what it means. Um, like we don't, like if a lactic acid bacteria is multi-pan drug resistant, like do we care? I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it just, the prevalence of it in the non-pathogens is just interesting and yeah. yeah. It's definitely scary to know that it's so prevalent and that yeah, just if we keep overusing antibiotics, we're just like making it easier for it to stay there. So yeah. thank you. That's really scary. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Uh, Samrit, can you tell us like how can we, like I know it's a very difficult question, but how we can bridge the gap in terms of the disproportionate burden that we observe in high income countries and LMICs? <laughs> Again? <laughs> you know, this is well beyond um, any single academic or individual and even beyond a certain any specific country, right? I think it, it's um, there's a lot of high-level plans, and, and um, 
I, I'm not sure how to answer, but, but I think it, for me, intuitively, I feel like the answer lies in saying, you know, let's not simplify. And in fact, AMR is not a single problem. Like sort of seeing it as a single problem is part of the problem, right? It, it should be, at least for human health, and uh, so I'm going to distance myself from, Bridget, mm -hmm. <laughs> from Jennifer here, but from a human health perspective, it really goes to the quality of care, quality of medical care aspect. So it encompasses things like, you know, infection control, basic water and sanitation measures, and then making good antibiotic prescription decisions. And that's much harder than you would imagine, um, not because doctors don't want to do the right thing. Every doctor wants to do the right thing, but because it really is hard sometimes to know when a patient comes in with kind of an undifferentiated illness, they have a multitude of symptoms, they have maybe a bit of fever, and you've been told and taught your entire life that infections can be deadly, and that's always the first thing you have to, and, and antibiotics are safe. So the first thing you have to get out of the way is treat the treat as though it's an infection while you do the other stuff. So that's the prevailing attitude. And for better or for worse, that's what we've taught all of the developing countries as well, or LMICs. That's what we've taught them as well, right? So, so that means we treat a lot of people as though they have an infection, knowing full well that three quarters of them are gonna end up not having an infection or at least not an infection that's responsive to antibiotics, right? It could be a viral infection or it could be not an infection, just something with a bit of fever. Mm -hmm. so, so there's um, you know, all of those things to consider. Uh, in, in, so I, I don't think I can come up with a way to bridge the gap, but I think um, the trend should be towards um, allowing complexity to enter into a lot of these discussions, mm -hmm. um, not try to dumb things down too much, um, and to just, you know, for every issue, try to do the right thing that makes sense long-term, think 10-year perspective, not the immediate or, you know, the, the, the one-year or the two-year perspective. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Philly, could you tell us uh, what is, the future of antibiotic research, like what does it look like? So I would say the future in the next few years, the next decade or so is relatively rosy. Um, things like the UN declaration, the World Health Organization declaration that you mentioned are leading to a lot more investment in antibiotic research. They're leading to a lot of efforts to solve a bit of the financial concerns to make it so that it makes sense to actually do the research before we're dealing with the Black Plague version 3.0. Um, so there is a lot of interest in antibiotics. There's a lot of interest in antimicrobial resistance, in understanding it, in getting a bit of a handle on this while we still have viable antibiotics, while we can still treat infections. Um, so that would be the rosy view. Um, the concern that I would point out is we've used antibiotics for about a hundred years. We've gone through, give or take, about half of the potential that exists in microbes, half of the potential things that we could target. That might be an overestimate. There might be three or four times as much available but it took several million years for those compounds to evolve. It took millions, tens of millions of years for all of these rich um, structures to come about. And we've been using them for about a hundred years and are facing a crisis in their use. So long-term use of antibiotics in the decades to centuries I think we're definitely going to need to find a different approach to, to treating infection. Yes, thank you very much. And that is a very good segue for my next <laughs> question. So uh, yeah, just in the interest of being less depressing maybe <laughs> a bit, I would like to know if there are any um, new technologies or alternatives to antibiotics uh, that you're excited for in the future. So one of the things that has been advancing pretty rapidly is diagnostics. When someone goes into the clinic, 
when they have what appears to be a bacterial infection. The standard of care for decades has been to take a sample of wherever the infection seems to be, the blood, the urine, what have you, and to culture it, to see what grows, to see what sort of bacteria are there, and then to see if those bacteria are susceptible to a given antibiotic. And that's incredibly effective. It's worked literally for decades, but it takes time. You have to grow the bacteria on specialized plates to isolate whatever's there. You have to test to see if they're susceptible to antibiotics. We're talking about three days, give or take. You can accelerate it a bit. Uh, I'm sure others know better than I can, or I do, but it still takes a fair bit of time. And so that means that a physician can either not prescribe for those three days, or they can just pick what is most likely to work. And the second option is obviously a lot better when someone's dying of an infection, but it leads to this huge gap where we're trying stuff without really knowing the best course. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of research in the last decade or so at shortening that from days to hours, getting it to a point where you can have someone on the appropriate treatment in that first day. Mm -hmm. And we've tried we as a collective, we have tried several different methods and I'm really excited to see over the next few years, which of those proves to be the most cost effective and the most efficient. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Samrit, do you have any? Yeah, I'm, I'm I also in the fear, sphere of diagnostics, but I'm more interested in, because I find that the three days for me from a stewardship perspective that it might take to confirm the diagnosis and the susceptibility is an acceptable delay because the overuse is not in those first three days. The overuse is in the continuation of a drug because the patient has gotten better. So the patient has gotten better, so therefore nobody wants to stop a drug and we have very poor data on what's the optimal duration of antibiotics. So the bulk of our misuse is in, is in the continuing uh, for two weeks, sometimes four weeks, and, and, and that's. So from a diagnostic perspective, I'm, I'm much more excited about the diagnostic test that would allow us to rule out an infection. So a patient that bring, comes in undifferentiated, looks very sick, to know whether or not he or she has a bacterial infection, or is this their cancer acting up, or is this a bad virus, like a new COVID, or is this an, you know, an autoimmune disease, that would be gold, and that would be really take care of probably 60, 80% of in our inappropriate use of antibiotics. In low and middle income countries, however, that even that very basic culture-based diagnostics of three days doesn't exist, right? So we're dealing with two very different um, pressures and, and needs uh, for that specific diagnostic question. So in a low and middle income country, I want to know if a patient has a bacterial infection and what it is, and whether it takes one day or three days, either way, that's good enough. And here, I want to know that a patient does not have a bacterial infection. What is, so I want the no answer very clearly. And that would, you know, alter my practice management, my practice, but it would also help all the, you know, clinicians make better treatment decisions. Yes, 100%. Super important. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ronholm, do you have anything you're looking forward to? Any um, new regulations or therapies or? Yeah, um, I think the regulatory space is going to be interesting. Um, I think we're moving towards, I mean, many, many fields of agriculture have moved towards using antibiotics that we don't use in humans. So things that have human toxicity we can use for agriculture. And I think you know, most agriculture is getting good at that in North America, um, where we're using these category four. Um, but I think a lot of the new technologies are really exciting. Like I think there's phage therapy now coming for some of these infections. I'm hoping the AMR thing, or the um, microbiome thing comes further. And we are seeing a lot of developments, even in just management practices. So like not putting sick cows beside healthy cows and, washing your boots before you go between farms. And you know, just simple things like that, if everybody does them, it'll cut down on infections a lot. And I think that's kind of exciting too. Yeah, thank you very much. One sec. 
Um, so going on what you said, um, I'm really excited about phage therapy. So I know very little of it, but what I know fascinates me. Of course, I don't know if it's going to be very likely to be used a lot in the future or not. But um, I do think that the cases that have proven successful are a good thing to like a, a good basis to build upon. And um, I'm really excited about uh, phage therapy. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm also really excited that these kinds of events are, are going on, you know, because awareness always needs to be raised. And <clears throat> we always, um, uh, if we know a problem, we can try to solve it or tackle it, right? If we don't know what's happening or if we, we don't know the, um, the problems, we are never going to even begin to try to solve it. So I think like raising awareness among uh, the scientific community or among like um, just people in general, it's very important. And I think that um, uh, the UN and um, this, I mean, it's very different, but like these kinds of events are really important. So people are starting to uh, know and understand, okay, this is like a problem. We, we need to maybe um, be careful about it. So yeah, I think awareness is really good. And like, I'm happy that um, there is going to be more money towards this research. And um, I mean, all we all scientists think that our field of research is the most important, right? Like we all want all the money for us. <laughs> But I really am glad that um, more money is going into antibiotic research, and as Dr. Finley say, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then here's another question just uh, for everyone. Uh, when you think about the future of antimicrobial resistance, are, are you optimistic? Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, uh, yeah, just like the problem playing out in the next decades? I mean, I can start as yeah. um, So in our lab, when we read a report or we um, start seeing all these new beta lactamases uh, coming um, on, we, I'm gonna tell you the truth, we're not really optimistic. We, um, I always have looked at this as like um, an arms race battle. And someone, some, uh, at one day told me bacteria are way ahead of us, like way ahead of us. So not to be depressing like mm -hmm. all of us, but um, like we really need to um, work, keep working and work harder because if not, I don't think we're going to be liking what it's in our future. Um, so I have a grad student who came a couple weeks ago and we were just talking about AMR and he said, it's okay, we're going to fix it. And I'm like, oh, we're all going to die, but <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm worried about what the future holds for this because I, I don't know that we're moving fast enough. But at the same time, when you see people coming up through with these great ideas who are super brilliant and who just have so much optimism and energy to work on these problems, you think, like, we might do it. And I think that's, like, where a little bit of optimism comes from. I'm actually quite optimistic, unlike, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic not from the perspective that there'll be a period in time when AMR will be behind us. It won't. I think it's always there. But I think we are learning a lot from uh, just in the last five years. We've, we've learned a huge amount, and it is bringing good brains to the problem, because partly because of the money that's been released uh, for fun the funding money that's been released into AMR. So I think it is changing practices and it is changing awareness. And there are new drugs that are being, they're not new classes of molecules, but there's a whole bunch of uh, new, you know, uh, refinements on existing drugs that are, that I'm using clinically in the ICU, you know, the drugs that are not completely Health Canada approved, but are FDA approved and that I can get as a, as a, what we call here, medicament d'exception. So I am you, making use of these things for the patients that I couldn't treat three years ago. Now I can treat them with these new drugs. Um, so there's a lot of incremental changes and, and, and that is what makes me hopeful. I, I believe more in incremental changes than one radical, 
you know, breakthrough solution. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll, depending on what our goal is, if we say there'll never be a death from AMR as of 2030, that's not true, mm -hmm. of course not. Mm -hmm. But overall, uh, I think we're heading probably in the right direction, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It's like that concept of running as fast as you can to just stay in the same place. So hopefully we'll um, slowly get better at it. Thank you very much. Yes, the Red Queen yes. from Alice in Wonderland. Yes. So I would, I am aligned, I think, a fair bit with Monsoon mm -hmm. in that we're currently in an arms race, uh, not necessarily yeah. between us and bacteria. We're picking a fight with evolution. And I don't think that's a fight we can win. Intrinsically, I don't think we can win that. Um, but we are definitely learning a lot about how it works. We're learning a lot about how resistance evolves, how it spreads, why it becomes dominant in a given setting, what potentially we can use to mitigate it or to diminish it. And so I think we've got a fair bit of use that we'll still be able to get out of antibiotics. We'll be able to continue using them for quite a while to come. I do think ultimately we'll have to pivot to something else. We'll have to get out of the arms race. We'll have to stop trying to fight evolution. But that's not to say that we cannot continue to use antibiotics, that they are not very useful drugs and very useful interventions against disease. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your insights. It's very um, important, all the po points you brought up. Um, so now we have more of an overview of what AMR is, uh, the present and the future of um, antibiotics. Uh, so let's talk about what we can do to mitigate this problem. So what, um, yeah, what can we start doing to kind of um, keep running <laughs> and, and try to, to, to escape this as much as we can? So again, these questions are uh, for everyone. So um, maybe we can start with Dr. Milius and go back there. So what do you ne think needs to be done um, in terms of innovation or policy change? Anything you can think of that um, you think would be beneficial or that should be starting to get done or start to think about? Uh... So coming from a research setting and especially one that's focused on bacterial evolution and the isolation of antibiotics, new compounds that could be antibiotics. I'm, of course, all for new antibiotics, for increased discovery, for finding new compounds, compounds with new mechanisms of action, new classes, all that kind of thing. I'm also really interested in the idea of focusing our efforts and finding compounds that most antibiotics, or all of the ones that are in the clinic right now, inhibit bacterial growth. That's part and parcel of what they are. An antibiotic by definition inhibits bacterial growth, but the ones that we have right now do so indiscriminately. So all settings, rich media, poor media, they target cells very efficiently because that's the ones we've picked. And I think if we move to compounds that are very specific to a given setting, compounds that, for example, would only be effective during an infection, we'd run much less of a risk of broad spectrum resistance because they only help the bacteria when they're harming a human or an animal, of course. And so that could forestall efficient resistance or at least make it much slower to spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's very uh, important because yeah, we see this shift from trying to find like broad spectrum antibiotics to more like personalized and specific treatments. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Semrit, um, same question. So uh, what do you think is something that we should really focus on that we should start working on? Um, if anything you can think of um, to, to yeah, slow down the progression. So again, being loyal to my own um, discipline or areas of interest, I think, um, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, I think the, the idea of diagnosing um, things that are not bacterial infections, so through a combination of you know, the, the immune system profile of a patient, of a person, 
when they're exposed to an infect, when they have a bacterial infection versus a viral infection versus no infection are kind of very different profiles. And this is an area of, of um, intense research now, studies with big proteomic studies, et cetera. So I think there will be interesting combinations of what we call biomarkers that we can really make use of in the clinical space. They've tried looking at simple biomarkers and none of them are, are good enough, but as a combination and as signatures, they will be able to, to make us much more intelligent around differentiating specifically and being much more precise around what's happening to the patient. So, so I think that's an area that I'm very interested in and, and that I hope we can test as intervention. We're trying to test one of these um, diagnostic tests in the ICU shortly. So um, it's um, mo more or less uh, through that area. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, don't, I like the human medicine because it's so different than agriculture, but we're never going to run diagnostics on, you know, 1,200 cows or 15,000 chickens that are all living together in a barn. So I think really there, it's all about prevention, preventing it getting into the flock or the barn and keeping it out. And I think to do that, we need new technologies, obviously. Um, but I think we need to use what we have as well. Like we need, we need better coverage with the vaccines that we have available. We need it to be used pretty indiscriminately to cut down on those infections. And we need um, better regulations, uh, you know, government regulations about our movement of animals and about our quality of housing for our animals to cut down on those infections. And I think ultimately we, we need a lot more education both for people who work in agriculture and the public to make good decisions about how we're farming and how we're using food and how we're moving food um, to reduce the amount of infection, infections that we have to deal with via antibiotics in agriculture. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Monse? Um, <clears throat> so of course we know and we've said this here that AMR is not just like someone's problem, right? It's not just the regulations problem. It's not just the scientists' problem. It's not the industry. It's not the agriculture. So I think like in order for us or like where we can keep doing that we lately like we've been kind of good at it. So like uh, just have conversation with uh, all the parts involved, like government, um, industry, academia, um, agriculture and uh, just bring the problems to the table and like be willing to uh, come with solutions. I know that this might be simplifying a lot of it, but um, we know that the like the, the AMR problem is not going to be solved with just one thing, right? It's going to be solved with uh, a lot of small steps. And like you said, it's not that it's going to be solved, but like <clears throat> we can improve in, in this. So just, I think, like by bringing everyone into the table and being willing to come up with um, things that will help us uh, will be good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then, like, of course, there's always um, like this aspect of what we can all do, like from our own um, little spot, like you know, from, uh, yeah, from, from our personal little battle that we can do. So like maybe Dr. Semret, if you could tell us like, what can we all do like us average citizens to slow down? Uh, and if anyone else also has any ideas to complement the discussion, please do as well. I mean, I, I think at an individual level, it's it's really goes down to avoid unnecessary antibiotic use. And then you're going to ask, but what? how do I know that it's necessary or unnecessary, right? So I think generally the, most people should remember that as young, healthy, if you're young and healthy, you know, undergraduate or graduate Concordia students, the likelihood that you need antibiotics for any reason is minuscule. Like I personally have probably taken antibiotics once in my life and I'm very old. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we, we kind of, in the, in the process as we're getting all alarmed about AMR, we forget that Yes, these are life-saving drugs, but they really should almost never be necessary. Our immune system is, is, a, is a very, very, very powerful entity that does almost everything and that combats bacterial 
overgrowth and invasion constantly every single day. So the, the times at which we need antibiotics is when our internal defenses have been overwhelmed, right? Either because we have a cut or a, a, a breach in our barrier or we've been immunosuppressed either because we got HIV or we are on chemotherapy or, you know, so the, the, the moments when we need antibiotics should almost never happen if you're not malnourished and you're generally quite healthy. So I could probably develop a bacterial pneumonia today and do better on my own without antibiotics the vast majority of times. So I think this kind of just reframing common, and I'm not going to encourage people, I'm not telling people <laughs> don't ever see the doctor and don't ever take antibiotics if it's prescribed. Mm -hmm. But you know, there, there's just kind of, uh, we have gotten used, we're in a society where we don't take any risks at all. So the slightest little cough, we want to have somebody tell us, and what if it's uh, bronchitis or pneumonia, can I please get my antibiotics, like why not? And so I would just kind of say that's, that's something we all should probably realize and reframe even a urine infection, and again, I'm not, I'm not encouraging people to stay at home if they're really sick, but most urine infections would resolve on their own with enough liquid and you know, with enough hydration and some basic prevention in order not to get the urine infection to begin with. So if, I think because of the ease and access and, 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 um, and price of antibiotics being very cheap and they're considered so safe, that we've all kind of let go and, and assume we need a course of antibiotics once a year. I think, I think that would be th probably the most impactful behavioral change from the public. Yes, that's 100%. I think it does require a large change in mindset because sometimes a lot of people will go to the doctor and if they don't leave their office with a antibiotic without a prescription. prescription. And, and yeah, and that uh, fortunately, that's one of the positive news of the last, you know, in 10, in 10 years ago, or even seven years ago, we used to say, oh, people are never going to accept this. And the GP sitting in his clinic will never accept, you know, not, not, and, and yet it is, the culture is shifting. Patients, you know, some patients that are very aware are asking all the questions and saying, no, I, I can wait, you know, and, and, and of course you have to have a plan and, and be willing to, intervene if the observation uh, part doesn't doesn't work and and there's many instances where now there's a lot of very good data for example you're traveling you're going to a developing country you're going to mexico for a trip everybody used to go with a course of antibiotics knowing full well that the tourista the acute diarrhea that you can develop in in uh, those countries is actually just a 24 or 48 hour illness which gets better without antibiotics, but everybody was taking antibiotics. Now, now that's changing, you know? So there are certainly behavioral changes that uh, the regular public can adopt. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And yeah, I think it all um, starts with like being able to share this knowledge and uh, yeah. more conscientization. Uh, Dr. Philly, do you, uh, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I was just going to chime in with my burning hatred of antimicrobial soaps. Yeah. <laughs> and just the general use of antibiotics when they're not necessary. Mm -hmm. I would like to point out though that antibiotics are kind of depending on how you count it, the third or fourth strongest tool we have against infectious disease. The first being sanitation mm -hmm. and then vaccination and then kind of tied with antibiotics, nutrition. And so there's a lot that can be done just literally whenever you get home wash your hands don't touch your eyeballs don't allow people to lick your eyeballs <laughs> and it will really cut down on the amount of antibiotics that are necessary in our day-to-day -day lives yeah thank you it's also very important <laughs> thank you uh and yeah like you also men mentioned nutrition just like in general like trying to live a healthy lifestyle will help you a lot not just antimicrobial resistance but like Many other things, so yeah, thank you. Um, anything else you, um, you would like to add? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for all of that. Then um, we have another question, like if, if anyone also wants to chime in, uh, it's for everyone. So is there any um, like message you want the public to know about antimicrobial resistance? Maybe some, like, uh, like for those who teach, like maybe some, uh, uh, 
things you hear, like misconceptions that you sometimes encounter or like from patients, uh, is there anything that you think might, like people might benefit from knowing? We've covered a, a lot of the um, a lot of the topics. I mean, there is a, used to be. I don't know if it's still. There is a bit of a common misconception about the duration of antibiotics. You know, we used to tell people, do not stop your your treatment course until you've had the full ten days as prescribed or the full full fourteen days. I mean, a lot of the duration evidence was based on very flimsy or no no real uh, clinical trial research. Mm -hmm. So that's an area of ongoing study, I would say, or a lot of randomized control trials now to see what is the optimal duration when you're treating a urine infection, a, a pneumonia, etc. So, so those are things that I think um, an individual patient could and should question uh, of their doctors mm -hmm. when they're getting a prescription. And aside from that, I think we've, we've discussed a, a lot. Yes, thank you very uh, much. But happy to ask any, uh, and try to answer any questions if there's some from the public. Yes, for sure. So that actually uh, brings an end to our discussion. Thank you very much for, uh, for all your insights and from everything you've shared with us today. And uh, yeah, if, if, if we have any questions from the audience, please feel free to raise your hand or your uh, virtual hand, and we'll try to, uh, to yeah. go through them. And also, if there's any questions uh, from Zoom, uh, you are, you're welcome to turn on your mic, just put your virtual hand up, we'll get to you. You can also pop questions in the chat and we'll read them out. For those of you in the space, I'm going to run over there with a the mic right now. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the nice discussion everybody uh, made and some of the nice insights we have gathered. I uh, just wanted to make sure, like as Dr. Findlay mentioned, that um, all the classes of the antibiotics, we feel like we have, uh, like we're not finding any new ones. And um, like, does it mean we have saturated all of it and bacteria only had like some of them left and now we are already landing on the pre-existing ones? And how, like, because these bacteria also live around other microbes, which are already resistant to what antibiotics they produce themselves. So won't evolution also like um, have a hold on that and evolve those products which were already uh, uh, resistant? And like, how can we approach this topic in a way that we can find new antibiotics? So I would say it comes down to two separate things. There's the targets of the antibiotics and I think there is definitely a limited number of viable targets within the cell, a limited number of things that are evolutionarily stable enough that you can actually hit them with an antibiotic, critical enough to the cell that impairing them causes problems and there are no backups, and low enough in density in the cell that there's a small number of targets that need to actually be inhibited. There's not 10 million copies, all of which would have to fall. And so, in that way, there's a relatively limited array of things that can be targeted, but there are definitely a lot more classes of antibiotics, a lot more structures, a lot more types of antibiotics that could target these things, that could target potentially um, hit targets we have not yet discovered. One of the key things in the drug discovery process though is when you have a validated drug, you have something that you know hits a target and does so very well. Making similar compounds, making analogs is fairly straightforward, much easier than coming up with a brand new one from scratch. And so with things like penicillin, where we had a drug that was really good, we made thousands of copies of it, thousands of slightly tweaked versions. And so, Right now, drugs based on it, beta-lactam drugs, account for roughly half of all of our prescribed antibiotics, both by variety and by sheer tonnage. And that's due to the fact that it's really easy to make different versions of penicillin. It's not because there aren't other drugs to be discovered. It's just we found a few that we really like, and so we tend to focus on them quite heavily. Thank you very much. That clearly explains my question. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. It was uh, really insightful. 
Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, vaccines, but uh, more in the context of agriculture. Uh, in my head, uh, vaccines equals prevention of the disease, and prevention in, in my books is probably the best way of preventing antibiotic resistance. Yeah, but um, uh, my knowledge is uh, limited in this space, but I see vaccination being talked about more in the context of agriculture uh, for, bacterial, for bacterial infections and not as much for humans. So what, my, first, my first question would be, why is that the case? And second, what is the state of uh, uh, vaccines against uh, bacterial infections in humans right now? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's another very good but very big question, but uh, there are certain uh, vaccines that are targeting bacterial infections. So as you know, generally vaccines are, are it's easier to, to target viral infections, but there is certainly a pneumonia vaccine that targets the bacterium Streptococcus pneumoniae. The, uh, there is a, a one against Haemophilus influenza that's called, you know, that, that targets that particular bacterium. The problem is that bacteria are large structures compared to viruses. Their outer member, their outer surface changes all the time, and there is a huge amount of variation. So you, these are huge populations of bacteria. It's not one type. So targeting, so coming up a with a particular vaccine that targets all possible strep pneumo, a strep pneumonia, the agent, one of the agents of pneumonia is, is virtually impossible. So what they do is they take specific serotypes of strep pneumo and then they'll, the current vaccine covers something like 10 or 12 of the common serotypes that cause invasive disease, but it can never protect you against all of strep pneumo becoming invasive. So it, it's a bit of a complicated answer that I'm giving you, but it's like bacteria are just essentially very complicated. So you have to pick your targets very carefully. So aside from the strep pneumo vaccine, which works well for uh, and the, the target as our young children, because there's a particular time in their lives between infants until the age of five or so, where they're particularly uh, prone to strep pneumo invasive infection. So they get the vaccines and then the elderly after 65. And then there would be patients who have, for example, don't have a spleen, they will be particularly susceptible to infections with Haemophilus influenza, so we have a vaccine for that. Um, and people who live in countries with uh, a lot of typhoid fever, the Salmonella typhi bacterium, there is a pretty effective vaccine, but that's because it's got a particular virulence factor. So that same vaccine would not work against all the other Salmonella species, which account for a huge amount, a huge burden of diarrheal infection. So if on top of that, you start considering that the big problem of AMR is in hospital acquired infections, which can be caused by a whole list of bacteria, gram negatives, gram positives, and they're all different strains, then you can see how it's, you, you can't resolve this with, um, with bacterial vaccines. Thank you very much. Any other? Okay. One right here. Thank you very much. So Dr. Makita, you mentioned the immune system several times. So I found it very interesting that, you know, now it's being used that whenever a patient is overcoming a, uh, an infection, you can maybe analyze the transcriptomics to know what gene signature is being expressed, right? But I was wondering if it's been explored some type of immunotherapy to maybe boost the immune system of the patient while it's while well, he has the infection. Yeah, that's, that's a really excellent question. And yes, it is an, another area which uh, I didn't mention earlier, but it, it is an area of, of intense research. So there is definitely uh, immune therapy for infectious diseases that's beginning to emerge. Um, and th this is um, a field that's um, borrowing a lot from the cancer field, from the oncology field. So you're, they're using kind of small, is that? She, I, she I researches see cancer, <laughs> this <one>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in fact, for example, one of my colleagues uh, or one of my former trainees who finished his infectious disease training, he's now in the US learning immunotherapy for certain, but we're starting with chronic viral infections that affect patients that are immunocompromised, again, because viruses are much more simple, smaller genomes. 
So he's, he's actually studying immune therapy for things like, um, like uh, CMV uh, infections, which affect our transplant patients quite a bit. For bacterial infections, it'll probably be, be a long while coming because the, the response to bacterial infections, the immune response is very co complicated. It's a huge cascade. Uh, whereas, and even for viral infections, it is. So it's unlikely they'll be able to find one specific um, molecule or an immunotherapy. But I think that's also a big um, area of interest. Thank you so much. Can for I now, we're just trying question? to avoid immunosuppression. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask another question? <laughs> so it was also mentioned that the main antibiotics or most of the antibiotics were made from fungi and other organisms. I was wondering if the secondary metabolites produced in plants that can also have antimicrobial activities have also been explored for human use? Uh, so there have been a number of components of plants that have been investigated for antibiotic use. To my knowledge, none of them have really made the leap into the clinic. Um, part of this is just due to the fact that plants don't tend to combat bacterial infections with natural products. They tend to use things like their tough outer coats, their bark in other words, or they use very nonspecific things like sap, just flooding the area with low level biocidal compounds. There are quite a few compounds that have been discovered with antimicrobial activity though. There's things like um, Quebecacin, which was found in maple syrup. There are components to marijuana that are also antimicrobial. There are essential oils. All of these things do inhibit the growth of bacteria, but they don't tend to do so at the high level and high specificity that you need for them to be an actual human therapy. Any other question? That's where. Uh, hi, thanks for a lovely discussion. I am a bit curious about the economic impact of antibiotic uses. So we know during COVID, Canada really struggled with vaccine production. We are not self-sufficient on that. So government had to spend a lot of money to import vaccines. Is it the same for antibiotics? Like, are we producing enough in Canada? Or if not, maybe reduction in uses, can that help us economically as well? Thank you. That's me. Uh, so, uh, so if I understood correctly, you're wondering whether we have the manufacturing capacity for antibiotics in Canada. No, it's a good question. We don't. We import a lot of our antibiotics, and we've been relying a lot on the U.S., um, our neighbor. But there, uh, thanks to COVID, this is one of the big lessons that was learned. So there is a big initiative, the biomanufacturing initiative, that was set forth by the federal government. I can't tell you the details because I, I don't know, but I know it was one of the big, big recommendations and that there, there are definitely attempts or the willpower to, to develop a vibrant kind of domestic sector for both vaccine production and potentially antibiotic production. And there is also now more funding for antimicrobial drug discovery in Canada. So it's unlikely, I think Canada, with the population that we have that will ever have like full huge you know bio manufacturing facilities but hopefully we can at least contribute to the global effort Do I, oh one more hi thank you this is more for dr ronholm but uh, everyone can chime in for the human aspect so um in regards to microbiome therapeutics uh, i guess the idea is if we use probiotics or specialized microbiome therapeutics we can maybe reduce the amount of antibiotic needed uh, for agriculture use or human use. Um, ha, ha, I'm, I'm assuming it's being used regularly in agriculture today. Has it decreased uh, antibiotic use or are they just using it at the same level? And if not, uh, why? Is it the not, not the right composition of microbiome therapeutics or probiotics? We don't know enough. I do not think there's a specific microbiome modification um, therapeutic in use today. There's a lot, we do use fermentation processes to produce animal food. We do put probiotics into animal food 
and stuff like this, but um, like a specific product where it's like, if you feed your chickens this, they won't get salmonella. Nothing like that exists yet. Um, I know there's a couple things like in the pipeline going through IP, but I don't think there's anything on the market as of today uh, that would do that. So I just, I think that we're not quite there yet. Uh, I think that's probably next decade. I think those types of products will come online. Great question, thank you. We have a question. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this has been super informative. Um, I, I work in the humanities, so forgive me if this is a bit of a tangential question or a bit of an ignorant question, but I was really interested in the discussion around farming and how um, not using antibiotics can then have that trickle down effect and affect humans through our food sources. I'm wondering if there's anything like on the flip side in terms of using antibiotics in agriculture and how that affects the environment and how like going into the runoff and into vegetation and other food sources that way and how that might implicate um, populations in a different way. Yes, that clearly happens. Um, if, if we take an antibiotic out, and we saw this in Quebec a couple years ago when certain antibiotics were removed um, from use in the poultry industry, uh, we saw human infections with resistant to those particular antibiotics like drop off from like 70 to 20%, like it was significant. Um, so we know it happens, like we know if we use it on the farm, we will see increases in infections in that specific antibiotic. I don't think we're clear on the pathways, like we know there's runoff into rivers, we know there's uh, manure spreading on fields, which then becomes produce, which then goes to our food. We know there's farmer infections, farmers are infected with MRSA at a rate of 720 fold greater than the average person. So I can imagine that the farmers are spreading those things to their communities as well. No, it's not their fault, obviously, but it's just, um, I don't think we have a good grasp on what proportions are spreading through each mechanism as particularly. So we know all things are in play. It's just how much of each. So those things absolutely happen. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I don't think we have any questions on Zoom. Do we, Bertie? No. OK. I think that's, that's it for the questions. OK. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much for all your questions. Uh, and thank you very much for being here, for offering your expertise. So. There are some predictions that if nothing is done by 2050, we'll have like 10 million deaths worldwide due to antibiotic uh, resistance. Um, fortunately, we are doing stuff like it's uh, we're trying to do progress and we're trying to come up with alternatives and you all do very fascinating and very critical work. So yeah, just uh, we really hope that you enjoyed the discussion that you found it interesting and that it served as a good reminder of how critical it is that we all uh, contribute to this problem that we are uh, informed and that we do our part so that those millions of deaths could hopefully be reduced. Uh, thank you very much for being here and uh, yes, yeah, so I think uh, that is it from my part. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks for coming into Force Space today for this. Thank you very much, Laura, for bringing everyone together. Uh, those of you uh, online, those of you in the space, appreciate your questions also. We're gonna be closing up the Zoom, closing up the live stream. Just a reminder, this conversation remains available on our YouTube channel. You can go home and watch it right away. Um, and just one, one quick note is just to say, we're, this is the last ep like the last uh, public scholar event that we've had for this year. And we're just, just thrilled to have been able to work with public scholars. Laura, we got Amy, we have asked for, I think there may be even Javier's around, um, but uh, just an ongoing project that we'd love to work with. So thank you everyone. Have a great weekend.